Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. Hope you're all keeping safe and well and a very happy new year to you all. I hope you had a great Christmas, whatever you got up to. Uh, for me, Christmas has been very extensive this year again, as you'll know from my previous video, which I called Christmas Favourites Part 1, to cover November, because there were a few festive things going on there as it was. And since then, Christmas has continued to be quite extensive. It's gone right into mid-January, so this video is effectively covering one and a half months. So it is a bumper video. There's lots to mention here. I've seen four theatre shows, gone to various meals with friends. I've been down to Devon for a little break. And on TV and online, I've watched things like Doctor Who and lots of comedies. And there's bits of music I want to mention as well and so on. And so I hope you enjoy the vast selection I've got here. Um, there is, of course, timestamps in the description if you want to jump to different bits. And there's a huge blog post to go with this with lots more detail and links and stuff if you want to go and check that out as well. None of it's sponsored or gifted either, apart from the PR invite that uh, Emily and I had to In Horto, the restaurant for which Emily got to write an article about. But all my opinions are my own anyway, regardless. Um, so, yeah, I think just because there's a lot to cover here, I'm just going to crack straight on with it. So I hope you enjoy. So we'll kick off with my little getaway that I had, which was down to Devon for a few days, because I still keep in touch with my old colleagues and school friends from down there. So I like to pop down for a visit every so often. I had gone down there earlier in the year, but this was the first time I've been down there for a festive visit for a little while, because last year I couldn't get down there because of the strikes and the snow. So I'm glad I was able to get down there this year. And as usual, I stayed at the Premier Inn on Torquay Seafront and enjoyed their cooked breakfast as usual, and the staff were really lovely and helpful. And indeed, the Premier Inn is attached to the Beef Eater restaurant, which was very handy because that's where I met some of my ex-colleagues for a lovely Christmas meal. So it was nice to meet up with them and have a catch-up, and some of us went on for a few drinks nearby as well in other places. I also popped over to Exeter as well and met an old school friend there, which was really lovely, and had a look around the Christmas market. They have outside Exeter Cathedral every year, and had a wander around the high street to see some of the decorations and the shops they got there too, because Exeter was a place I spent a lot of time in when I was younger. And then back in Torquay, I also had a look at the Bay of Lights trail that they had along the seafront there, which wasn't as good as London's displays, of course, but it had some nice installations, including a big pixel tree and a snowflake and a comet and an octopus. And there was some Christmas music playing as well. And it was quite popular with the crowds. So there was a lot of people wandering on the route. So it was nice to see that getting plenty of attention. So it was a nice trip away. And I've made a post about it as well on my blog and posted a video of the Christmas lights trail in Torquay. So you can go and check all that out if you wish to. So then back in London, and the first of the many outings that I did that I want to mention is to a museum. And I went to the Charles Dickens Museum with Emily Davison, who I work with as a support worker. And it's a very appropriate museum, of course, because he wrote A Christmas Carol, so it was the natural place to go. But strangely, neither I nor Emily had ever been there before, even though we've been in London for ages. So it was nice that we finally got the chance to go there. All the rooms are fully furnished, as they would have been in his day, and they're decorated a bit for Christmas as well. And there's various documents and pictures on display as well. And yeah, it's just a really, really nice place. The audio guide was used for and we had a nice mince pie and a glass of hot chocolate in their cafe as well so it's a really nice museum to go to. Once Emily and I had finished at the museum we then went to the first of four theatre shows that I saw during the festive period and this first one was called The House with Chicken Legs and it took place at the South Bank Centre. It was also described by Vocalise so we got a nice touch tour on stage beforehand as well looking at the house from the title and various props and puppets and dolls and costumes and things so it's all really useful for putting it into context when we then had the audio description through our headsets during the performance itself. And the show is based on a novel by Sophie Anderson, which I'd never heard of before, but you don't need to know the story to follow what's going on. And indeed, there are a few little twists and surprises along the way anyway. Emily had read the book before, so she did know the story, but she enjoyed the show as well, and I got the impression that it was quite faithful to the book. It's basically about a 12-year-old girl called Marinka, played by a lady called Eve de Leon Allen, who I've seen before as Angie Maitland during Series 7 of Doctor Who, it turns out. I discovered that later. And she lives in a house with an older lady called Baba, who is the guardian of a gateway through which dead people can pass to their next next destination then they have a little party and then they send them on their way with like positive thoughts and everything and Marinka is next in line to take over that important role but she isn't very keen to do so she just wants to live a normal life but she can't do so because of this duty but also because the house uses its chicken legs to move to different locations on a quite a frequent basis as well so they can meet different groups of dead people and take them across to the other side so she can't settle anywhere and she can't make any long-term friends as a result so the play is ultimately about Marinka's attempts to find happiness in her life and the lessons she learns along the way particularly when an unexpected event forces her to reassess everything and it's a lovely story 
story with some funny and uplifting moments and more dramatic and emotional scenes as well. And there's lots of lighting and back screen projections used to great effect. I'm talking about scenery and travel, especially in the second half. And puppets are used creatively during the show as well. There's a jackdaw called Jack, who is Marinka's only constant companion who travels around with her. And the set of the house is moved around the stage regularly as well to reveal the interior or lifted up on its chicken legs, which is quite impressive. And the dead people who turn up are represented by the masks that they wear and they communicate with each other using musical instruments instead of talking. And so the performers also provide the musical backing for the songs that are a part of the show as well and other parts of the score. Indeed, there's a whole soundtrack album to go with the show because there's some lovely songs in there. There's elements of Russian folk music as well, reflecting the background of Marinka and Baba in the story and some more contemporary theatrical styles as well. So it's a nice mixture of um, different music styles in that show. So altogether, I really enjoyed the show. It's quite long, about two and a half hours with a 20 minute interval, of course. But it's really nicely constructed in terms of the story, visuals, puppetry and music. And the touch tour and the audio description was very useful for following it all. So yeah, it was really, really nice, that show. We enjoyed that. And then I went out for a meal with Emily afterwards as well. But I'm going to mention that a bit later in this video. And then the very next day, by myself this time, I went to see The Time Machine, a comedy at the Park Theatre in Finsbury Park, which also included a touch tour and audio description, this time delivered in-house by the wonderful Roz Chalmers, who I've met at other shows in the past, so it was great to see her again. And the cast of the show very kindly came out to introduce themselves at the start of the tour as well, which was very generous of them before they went off to go and get ready. And then we had a look at The Time Machine itself, as well as costumes, hats and props and things, because there's quite a few costumes used. Some of the costume changes are very quick, and some of the props are only used briefly, so it was nice to be able to see them close up so that when they were mentioned in the audio description we knew what was going on we knew we had seen them and there's lots of visual jokes in the show so again the audio description was vital for that and the show is basically about a trio of amateur actors who are attempting to put on a play so in that sense it's a little bit like the mischief theatre stuff that I've mentioned before like the play that goes wrong on stage the goes wrong show on TV and other stuff like that and leading cast member Dave Hearn in this show is a founder member of the mischief group but this is separate to them it's different and it works somewhat differently as well to those mischief shows but it's still a farce at the end of the day it's still very very funny and Dave is joined by Michael Dillon and Amy Ravel and they're a good cast they interact very well with one another and the premise is that Dave is a direct descendant of H.G. Wells so he's attempting to put on a play about Wells' discovery of time travel and they all play several different characters along the way from across time while trying to tell that story like people that H.G. Wells would have met but also Pat and Frank Butcher from EastEnders and Kermit and Miss Piggy from the Muppets and some mysterious beings from the future there's quite a mixture in there and the actors also get frustrated with each other on various occasions when things don't work the way they're supposed to and there's one particular error that they make there's a major oversight that has dire consequences which affects the second half completely and the time machine they have turns out to work a little too well so they can travel back in time but they can't fix the mistake they made because that would then cause a paradox so no matter what they try and do whatever is going to happen will happen anyway so it's all about their attempts to try and get around that and there's some audience interaction involved in that second half in particular which makes it all quite fun so yeah it's very amusing very well choreographed and there's some good music as well because Amy is constantly trying to shoehorn in tracks by Cher as she's a massive fan and Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song is used to introduce each half which is a nice touch so it was a lovely way to have a laugh and some fun at Christmas and the show is touring the UK in 2024 so there's plenty of opportunity to see it I can recommend going to see it it is very very funny Next up, in between Christmas and New Year, I met up with three of my friends, including Emily again, as well as my best mate Simon and his wife, who happens to be called Tina, because we saw the Tina Turner musical at the Aldrich Theatre. And we had two guide dogs with us as well, between the four of us. Emily had her guide dog Rosie, and Simon had his dog as well. And the staff were absolutely wonderful. They gave us two private rooms, one for Emily and her dog, and one for Simon with his, who was a member of staff and looked after each dog during the show, and we were able to see them during the interval and then after the show. So they were constantly kept company, and the staff were very, very nice. So thank you to all the staff of the Aldrich Theatre for the wonderful service they gave us. And the production itself was fantastic. It wasn't audio described because they don't offer that anyway, unfortunately. But we managed to write without it and you ultimately go there for the music anyway. And it's basically about the story of the late great Tina Turner, as the title implies. With her blessing as well, she was involved in its creation and it goes from her upbringing in Nutbush right through to her stardom as a major you know, singer and everything. And it doesn't shy away from the tough hurdles she faced along the way either, including the domestic abuse she suffered from Mike Turner. He's not a very nice guy, really. You soon come to realise that during the show. And her attempted suicide and overcoming racism, sexism and ageism in the record industry to prove herself worthy. She really had to work hard at it, which makes her success all the more admirable, really. She was an incredible woman. And it contains a lot of her songs as well, of course, most of which I knew. The lead actress, Carrie Sanders, 
Anderson emulates and embodies Tina incredibly well. You know, she's never going to be an exact clone of her by any means, but she was really, really good. And she wasn't even phased when she had to repeat a song because there was a technical fault, which I've never had happen in a theatre show before, but they had to bring the curtain down and take her off stage at one point. I don't know what the error was, but she came back on and the audience had been very patient and they applauded her when she came back. So yeah, credit to all the staff and the cast as well for not letting that phase them. You know, it's just something you're going to get used to really, but it's, you know, it's a big thing. You know, it's a big interruption when you're in the flow of a show like that. So credit to them for getting through that without any problems. And then the finale is like being in a Tina Turner concert itself with all the audience involved as well. It's the closest you're ever going to get to that kind of experience. I know there's tribute acts out there as well, but I can't imagine any of them being much better than this because they really have worked very hard on it. So yeah, it's a great show. Very interesting and enlightening and also just a great tribute to one of the best, as the song goes, of all time. And then my final theatre show of the festive season, and also my favourite, and also the latest one as well, because I didn't see it until the 10th of January, was the legendary Palladium Pantomime, which I was finally able to get to. I had tickets for the one last year, but I couldn't go because I got COVID in the end. And it looked like this year's might be scuppered as well because of the tube strikes, but thankfully they were called off last minute. So I was able to go, and it was an amazing experience. And we had a touch tour to start with on the stage, which is a big privilege in itself. It's a massive, beautiful stage, and they had a huge table on there laid down with all sorts of props and things from the show. And there was also a costume to look at that Julian Clary wears, one of many that he wears. And also we could look at the arches that frame the stage as well, which was nice. So, yeah, it was a real privilege and a real thrill to look at everything close up. And the audio description during the show was really useful as well. But the show itself is just incredible. It's so funny and there's lots of great music and choreography and stunts in there as well. It's very, very loosely built around the story of Peter Pan. But ultimately, it's a big variety show, really. They just have fun with it. Julian Clary is the central star in the show, playing Seaman Smee. He wore various different costumes, completely outrageous costumes, every single time he appeared. And he had lots of funny gags and innuendo those of course but there's also a more serious moment as well when he paid a very moving tribute to the late Paul O'Grady which was beautiful he sang a song in his honour so that was really nice he's been in every single panto since they returned to the Palladium in 2016 as has ventriloquist Paul Zerdin who was there with his puppet Sam he was very funny and veteran actor Nigel Havers as well who played pirate Nigel and he was regularly teased about his age Gary Wilmot was there playing Captain Hook's mother Henrietta he's been in nearly all the pantomimes Julian Paul and Nigel started in 2016 Gary joined them in 2017 he's very good as well the big newbie this year was Jennifer Saunders playing Captain Hook and she was very good continuing it was her panto debut she really got into that nicely and Rob Madge was playing Fairy Tink and then we also had Louis Gaunt as Peter Pan and an understudy playing Wendy we didn't get to know their name but she was very good and yeah it was just a really entertaining show I've written a whole blog post about it because it deserved one so go and check that out if you want all the details because it was a really good show I really enjoyed that and I will certainly try and go and see more of the pantos they do in future years oh yes i will and then i've also been out for some nice meals with friends as well so the first of those was with my good friend claire we went to bills in covent garden where we'd also been to for my birthday back in august so it was nice to return there and we didn't eat from their Christmas set menu because we hadn't booked early enough to order from that. But we did have cocktails from the Christmas specials menu. I had a couple of glasses of the apple and spice, which had Jameson whiskey, mulled spices, cloudy apple and Sicilian lemon juice, which was very nice. And the food was great as well. And I was very full after I had some chicken and sesame dumplings, an eight ounce char grilled rump steak, which was deliciously thick, and a triple chocolate brownie I managed to find room for at the end as well because that was irresistible. And we also had a nice little walk afterwards as well. I showed her some of the lights and decorations in Covent Garden and we'll look at the tree outside the Savoy Hotel. So, yeah, that was a very nice little afternoon together. And then after seeing the Charles Dickens Museum and the house with chicken legs with Emily, the two of us then went to a restaurant called In Horto, which she had a PR invite in order to review for a journalism role. And I will say, having said that, that all opinions are my own here and all opinions in Emily's article are her own. And I say that because I'm about to praise it to high heaven because it genuinely was amazing in there. It's a really nice atmosphere when you go in. The staff are lovely. The food was delicious. Yes, I know the staff are supposed to be nice anyway, but you get the impression from the reviews online on TripAdvisor and Google getting 4.5 plus star ratings that it is good in there. And yeah, we just felt really welcome, really comfortable, and the food was genuinely very nice. And we shared a baked Tunworth cheese to begin with, so we could dip some pieces of bread into that. And then I had the beef and bone marrow pie for the main course, which was really, really tasty. There were big, tender, succulent chunks of meat in there, 
beneath a puff pastry and a delicious gravy and there's a big bone in the middle with bone marrow in it that you could scoop out with a spoon so yeah it was really really nice but I did somehow manage to find room for some apple crumble with ice cream for afters as well and for drinks I had a pear sour cocktail and a glass of red wine which was nice and Emily also got me to try a glass of Bailey's because she was shocked that I'd never had one before as far as I remember I've never had one but it was nice anyway I enjoyed that and I would have it again so yeah we were very happy and practically rolling back to London Bridge Station afterwards and yeah I could just highly recommend it um, it is a bit of a hidden gem it is a bit tucked away so you might find it difficult to find to begin with but it's well worth looking out for so i'll put a link to emily's review in the description below and you can also if you want to read another bit of her work on her blog on fashion Easter, there's an extensive blog post about how disabled people really feel about the beauty industry and some of the innovations that brands have implemented with disabled people in mind because it's been a big project she's had to do as part of her diploma and i helped check it over a bit for her because of that as a support worker so yeah go and check that out because she's very pleased with that and i am happy to say that she's getting some very good grades on her diploma as well and the exams that she's done already so she's making good progress with that well done Emily and it's also quite strange to think in fact that I've been working with Emily for a year now as of mid-January that's soon gone that time and a lot's changed in that time you know I've learned a lot I've taken on more duties as the time's gone on and my hours have gone up from 22 at the start to 37 now so yeah it's worked out really well we've made a good partnership there and hopefully that will continue this year. And then after the Tina Turner musical, I took my friends Simon and Tina to the Bear and Staff pub in Leicester Square for a meal. Emily couldn't join us for the meal after the show, so she went straight home. But once we'd seen her off, we went over to the pub. And we had a lovely time in there as well. We knew we would because, again, it's another place that I went to for my birthday. It was where I went with Simon when he came over to stay for a few days. So, yeah, we had a lovely time in there. We didn't have everything we wanted, but we still had some nice food regardless. I let Simon have the one remaining slow-cooked beef rib shin and pulled brisket pie, which was huge. It was bigger than any of us had expected, but he managed to finish it and he enjoyed it. And I went for the Steak and Nicholson's Pale Ale Pie, which came with some surprisingly big carrots and some nice mashed potato and a little jug of gravy as well. And I followed that with sticky toffee pudding and custard for dessert. And it was all very, very nice, filled me up very nicely. And I had a couple of pints of Henry Weston cider with it as well. So that was a lovely meal too. And then at home, my mum and I have stuffed our faces with lots of nice things as well. Many of them not at all healthy, but then it is, of course, Christmas after all. We got plenty of food from M&S for starters. In particular, we got a turkey crown and a three-bird roast from their Christmas food to order service. And they cooked really nicely. They were really tasty. And we also got some nice treats when I went in the shop in person a few times as well. So yeah, we did very well with M&S. You can never go wrong with them. And then we also got our regular grocery deliveries from Sainsbury's, of course. And their stuff is also nice, especially their taste of different range. So we had plenty of Christmas treats in there too. And we were able to use Nectar Point to get some nice discounts as well that we'd built up during the year and then we also treated ourselves to a takeaway one weekend as well we got the festive pizza from Domino's which had sage onion turkey sausage smoked bacon onions and mozzarella cheese and a bit of cranberry drizzle and that was nicer than we expected actually mum and I both enjoyed that and then my aunt also gave us a nice bag of goodies as well including a tub of roses and little boxes and Maltesers and matchmakers and other little bits and pieces so yeah we had plenty to nibble on over Christmas altogether and we were very nicely fed so then staying at home and there's been lots of bits of entertainment I've been watching and listening to as well of course so let's do a rundown of that now and the big thing is of course Doctor Who because it's been celebrating its 60th anniversary so the BBC have gone to town on that as have I, I mean over the past year I've written reviews of the first four series of the modern era plus the final specials of David Tennant as the 10th Doctor because I wanted to get all those out of the way before David Tennant returned for the anniversary specials along with Catherine Tate as Donna Noble, it was lovely to see them reunited it was lovely to see their story resolved as well so that Donna was able to get her memory back safely and the doctor was able to go into retirement with Donna's family so that when he then returns as Shooty Gatwa's doctor he's got rid of all the emotional baggage he's refreshed and it's just going to be fun you know Shooty Gatwa looks like he's going to be a lot of fun as the next doctor judging by the Christmas special and his entrance at the end of the trilogy of anniversary specials as well you know I love the bi-generation concept that was quite fun it's nice to see a surprise like that And I love the music that Murray Gold's given him as well. It's great to have Murray back as the composer and Russell D. Davis back as showrunner. It was lovely to see Bernard Cribbins again as well in one final appearance before the actor sadly passed away. So yeah, we are entering a nice new era of the show. It's great to have some old hands back on deck behind the scenes again. And yeah, I'm just really looking forward to seeing where the show goes from here. It's looking better. It's more inclusive as well because there's an important wheelchair user in unit now who's got a great role. And there's also more inclusivity in terms of gender because there was a transgender character with Donna Noble's daughter Rose obviously that's led to some people saying oh the show's gone woke and all this nonsense but yeah just ignore them it's nonsense so yeah it's really looking good 
I'm really looking forward to the future. Now it's been kind of revitalized and rebooted once again. So I've written a big blog post all about those specials because they released a Blu-ray still book just before Christmas, which was great. So I've gone through the specials and the extras as well, including Doctor Who Unleashed, which is the successor to Confidential going behind the scenes. It's great we've got a series like that again. I've also done a post about various radio shows I've listened to on BBC Sounds as well, including the wonderful Celebration concert. There's been documentaries on there and some interviews and some music mixes as well that I've been listening to on there from various people who've worked on the show, which is good. And then, of course, there's the Hooniverse on iPlayer, which has got all of the series, you know, as many episodes of the classic era as they can get hold of, and all the new episodes as well, and spin-offs and documentaries and concerts and various other extra bits and pieces. So it's been really great to go through all that. And a lot of it's accessible as well. All of the series have got not just subtitles, but audio description and sign language as well, and some of the extra features, spin-offs, and that have also got audio description and or sign language as well, which is fantastic. So, yeah, well done to the BBC for giving us so much material for free or within the license fee obviously and for making it accessible it's been really really good going forward i am going to continue reviewing doctor who but i'm going to have a break for the time being because there's other bits i want to catch up on that's obviously distracted me from other dvds and blu-rays that i've bought and other tv shows that i want to catch up with you know online and on tv so yeah there's plenty of other things for me to look at but i will get back to doctor who later in the year not just for tutor gatler's new series but also continuing with my review of the modern era going through the spin-offs like Sarah Jane and Torchwood and Matt Smith's era as the Doctor, that kind of thing. So yeah, I will be getting back to that, but for the time being, I'm going to have a bit of a break from that. And then beyond that, I've also been watching lots of comedies as well, so I'm just going to rattle through these fairly quickly. And starting with some game shows, I saw Would I Lie to You, which is always very funny. And this year's Christmas episode starred Victoria Cora Mitchell, Naga Manchetti, Alex Brooker and Melvin Hayes. And a new series has also just got underway as well since then, which is fantastic. Similarly, QI has just started a new series as well, and they kicked off with a nice Christmas special featuring Eshar Akbar, Joe Brand and Jimmy Carr, alongside regular participant Alan Davis. That was very funny. And for once, we've got the extended XL editions running alongside the regular length editions, which makes a nice change because sometimes the XL editions are delayed by weeks or even months sometimes. So I hope they keep that up as a regular thing now. The Big Fat Quiz of the Year has been back on Channel 4, of course, the annual quiz looking back at what's been going on over the past 12 months, hosted by Jimmy Carr. This year's edition featured Richard Iowadi, Mel Gedroich, Rosie Jones, Catherine Ryan, Mo Gilligan and Kevin Bridges, which isn't their best lineup, but it was still fun enough. I couldn't answer a lot of the questions, to be honest. I'm not into a lot of modern things these days, but it was still interesting and funny. Rosie Jones obviously sadly got a lot of ableist abuse online, as she often does when she appears on TV, which is a great shame. But yeah, it was uh, fun enough, that show. Jimmy Carr also hosted 8 out of 10 Cats Does Countdown, of course, which is also back for a new series at the moment. And this year's Christmas special had Danny Dyer, Joe Lysett, John Richardson and Roisin Connerty, which again isn't one of their best lineups, but it was still amusing. No one's going to replace Sean Locke properly anyway. No one can be as good as he was, but it's still fun. Um, Joe Wilkinson returned as well. And Nick Mohammed was Mr. Swallow in Dictionary Corner, which wasn't very entertaining. The people in Dictionary Corner often aren't very good. But yeah, again, it was a good way to kill an hour. And then we've had a couple of specials of Taskmaster as well, which has been great. First, we had the New Year Treat, um, which is where people who wouldn't normally appear on the series get a chance to give it a go anyway. So we had disabled actor Lenny Rush on there, who was good fun and won the show. Zoe Ball, who I also liked, was on there. And Deborah Meaden, I was aware of, although I'd never seen Dragon's Den. But it was great to see the two of them out of their depth. And I didn't know the other two contestants who was on there, musician Koji Radical and naturalist Steve Backshaw, but they were also good as well. As I say, it's always good to see people out of their own depth, even if you don't know them. It's a good fun show for bringing people together, that. And then more recently, we've just had the latest Champion of Champions episode, featuring the winners of Series 11-14, to 14, Sarah Kendall, Morgana Robinson, Sophie Duca and Dara O'Brien, along with the runner-up of Series 15, Kyle smith Bino, because he was standing in for the unavailable champion, Mae Martin, with her blessing. So yeah that was good fun as well and there is series 17 on the way once again i'm trying to avoid seeing who's in it so i haven't looked at the new lineup for series 17 but it's going to be a lot of fun whoever's in it and talking of greg davis of course who hosts taskmaster he also hosted nevermind the buzzcocks on sky i don't tend to watch that series normally unless there's people on the panel who i really really like but i did look at the christmas special and that was all right it featured noel fielding jamali maddox and daisy may cooper as the regulars joined by harry hill ricky wilson from kaiser chiefs and Leanne Pinnock from Little Mix and there were also appearances from the Wurzels and various other people as well so yeah that was a good show 
And then on the radio, Mum and I have enjoyed listening to her. I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. As per usual, that's always very funny. And Just a Minute has now replaced that in the usual Monday night cycle. So we're listening to that too, because we like that show as well. And for The Unbelievable Truth, there was a seasonal compilation of that as well on Radio 4. And that's the show where people have to give a short lecture on a given topic. There's all lies apart from five truths they have to try and smuggle past the rest of the panel. And they all have to try and obviously spot those truths. So yeah, there was a special compilation of the festive topics they covered on that. And at the moment, while we're having our dinners, Mum and I are actually listening to old series of The Unbelievable Truth because they've got all the old series available as free podcasts on Audible, which is lovely. So we're enjoying going through those. So then moving on to sitcoms, and every year I usually watch a few classic Christmas specials from sitcoms of the past that I really like, but I don't bother talking about them because I prefer to talk about new things and things that I haven't seen before. But I'm going to make one exception this year for One Foot in the Grave because there was a brand new high-definition restoration of the feature-length special One Foot in the Algarve that was broadcast on BBC4 and is now on iPlayer. And this is a completely new scan and grade using the original camera negatives, and it looks much better for it. You know, even with my eyesight, I can tell that it looks really good. So, yeah, well done to everyone involved in that. It looks great. It's basically the feature length special about a disastrous holiday to Portugal that the Meldrews go on. So, Victor gets into various scrapes, and Margaret gets annoyed with him as usual. Mrs. Warboys meets her romantic pen pal, who turns out to have a bit of a secret. And guest star Peter Cook plays a paparazzi photographer who has a series of amusing accidents while trying to retrieve a roll of film that the Meldrews have accidentally picked up of his. There's a lot going on there. It's a lot of fun. And on that same evening, they also broadcast a new high-definition remaster of a special of Last of the Summer Wine as well called Getting Sam Home. But I didn't watch that because I never really got into that show. But yeah, it's great that they are restoring some of these old shows. And Richard Latto, who was involved in the One Foot in the Grave restoration, also was involved in the recent release of the Blackadder Blu-ray as well, which I haven't watched yet, but I do intend to watch that soon and review that. And then there was one new Christmas special I saw in terms of sitcoms, and that was the 100th episode of Not Going Out, starring Lee Mack, which is quite some achievement. That sitcom is still going strong. It still follows kind of basic sitcom conventions in terms of the stories and things. There's nothing exceptional there, but it works. It's still funny. So, yeah, in this episode, Lee and Lucy agree to invite an old man over to their home for Christmas dinner to give him some company. But Lee gets into trouble and tries to hide the evidence, and it gets increasingly fraught for him. And, yeah, it's just good fun. So then next we have some stand-up comedy specials and I'll start with Dawn French's show which for politeness sake I'll say was called Dawn French is a Huge Twit and this is a recording from Dawn's show last year filmed at the London Palladium and the special on BBC One lasted for 75 minutes but I watched the extended version on iPlayer that ran for two hours and it's very funny indeed because Dawn's a great storyteller and so she tells us about lots of times that she's humiliated herself in one way or another during her 40-year career for the most part but also bits of her personal life as well And it's illustrated with the aid of photos and video clips on the back screen of the stage as well. And she covers a long period of time. You know, the comic strip is in there and the Vicar of Dibley, obviously, and various other shows she's done. So it's an interesting insight into her career in general as well, really. But there's a lot of great stories. She takes it all with good grace and humour and everything. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that. The other big special, of course, was Armageddon by Ricky Gervais over on Netflix. And I've enjoyed his previous specials. But I have more mixed feelings about this one, as do various people online, clearly. It's not his best. Some of it is funny. Um, He does make light of some of the extreme claims that woke people have claimed to behave. He raises fair points about how humanity is destroying itself and the planet and observes how language and society has changed. And I do like some of his darker jokes. I don't have a problem with some of that stuff. And he's won a Golden Globe Award for the show I know, and it's raised lots of money for animal charities, which is great. However, he does seem to be relying more and more heavily on just causing offence to get kind of publicity and laughs rather than telling good, clever jokes, to be honest, because he knows that if he offends people, then they'll complain online. It'll be extra publicity for his show. So, yeah, he's kind of leaning on that more and more. And it's been illustrated by the fact that he posted a clip from the show where he uses the R word, which I'm not going to say, but he posted that as publicity, knowing that it would stir things up. And it did, because the real problem with that isn't quite so much the fact that he used the word although it's not a good thing but it's more the fact that when disabled charities and disabled people raise grievances and concerns and complaints and get upset about his use of the word a lot of Ricky's fans then give them abuse for it because apparently people expressing those sort of opinions are just weak and inferior and to them Ricky Gervais is a god and he can't be insulted and he's got a right to say whatever he likes but I think the fact is that Ricky hasn't called that out. You know, he he must know that's happening. He's not naive. He knew the reaction it would get, but he's not kind of saying, you know, I don't want you abusing people who get upset by that. He's just letting it happen by not saying anything. And 
yeah, it kind of lowers him in my kind of estimations, really. And it's not the sort of fan base I want to be associated with. That's the sort of people he's happy to attract now. So, yeah, it kind of makes me uncomfortable, the fact that he's let that happen and he knew that would happen. So, yeah, if people had more respect for other people's opinions and weren't so abusive on social media and everything, it wouldn't be an issue. You know, it could be a great opportunity to, you know, just at least raise awareness about why the word is wrong and all the rest of it. But people don't seem to be capable of not being inflammatory these days on social media, which is a great shame. So, yeah, it's not his best show and we'll see if he does another show next year and what that's like. But then moving on to nicer things, and another special I saw was by Fern Brady on BBC iPlayer called Power and Chaos. I spotted this while I was just looking through the list of stand-up shows that they have on iPlayer, and it caught my eye because I've seen her on Taskmaster, so I thought I'd give it a go, and she's pretty good. Um, This was filmed before lockdown hit in 2020 and was broadcast the following year, but it's now back on iPlayer because it was repeated on BBC Scotland in mid-December because she is Scottish. And it's pretty good, as I say. She's very down-to-earth and open about herself, very good at telling stories in an interesting and amusing way. So she talks about living in England as a Scottish person and being diagnosed with autism and coming out as bisexual and how a routine she did about the DUP leader, Arlene Foster, got her into trouble and various other bits and pieces. So, yeah, I'm glad I looked at that. It's a good show. And then over on Radio 4, Mum and I listened to Stand Up Just William, where Martin Jarvis gave a live reading of one of the Just William books by Richmond Crompton called William's Truthful Christmas, where William takes it to heart at church when he's told that, you know, it's important to tell the truth. And so he literally does tell the truth about everything, even if that means other people getting upset and he can't understand why people are getting upset because he's surely doing what the adults and God wants him to do. So, yeah, that's quite funny. They're always nice, so it's just William's stories. And Martin Jarvis has been reading those for years and years, so he's a very good narrator of those stories. And then moving away from stand-up, but sticking with the radio for now, BBC Radio 4 Extra devoted their entire Christmas Eve schedule to the late, great Nicholas Parsons, who would have turned 100 in October. So they had a special collection of programmes introduced by his good friend Paul Merton that they played on a loop throughout the day. So Mum and I went through the shows together, day by day, while we were having our dinners, and they were really nice to listen to. There was a Christmas Carol by Candlelight, where Nicholas was reading the Dickens classic, while there was some music accompanying it as well, which was really nice. There were a couple of programmes about places he grew up and worked in, which were really interesting to listen to. There was an old episode of the Arthur Haynes show, which was an interesting curiosity. It was mildly amusing, so it was interesting to hear that. Likewise, there was another comedy called Listen to This Space, which was inspired by That Was The Week That Was, but this particular programme Mum and I had never heard of before. And again, it was mildly amusing as a bit of curiosity, not something we listened to again. There was How Pleasant To Know Mr Lear, which was a two-part programme where Nicholas was reading lots of nonsense poems by Edward Lear and telling us about his history and all that. So that was pretty interesting. And then there were a couple of classic episodes of Just A Minute, which is the game show that Nicholas hosted for over 50 years, of course. There was an episode from 1976 with Kenneth Williams, Peter Jones, Alfred Marks and Sheila Hancock and then a more modern episode from 2017 which was the last time that Nicholas was on the show with Sue Perkins who later went on to take over as host and the other contestants on there are Giles Brandreth, Andy Hamilton and Paul Merton and I prefer the modern episodes to be honest because people like Kenneth Williams from the past are a bit before my time and Kenneth gets a bit irritating as well sometimes when he gets a bit full of himself but yeah I mean both episodes were good in their own way and there's also a documentary on called Just a Minute's Indian Adventure where Nicholas visits Bangalore and Mumbai to see how people there have created their own versions of the game their own local versions because it's very popular out there and then just before the 2017 episode of just a minute there was also a nice chat between paul merton and sue perkins about what it's been like for to take over the show and why they love just a minute and nicholas parsons in particular so that was a lovely little chat and a lovely little tribute to nicholas and yeah nicholas was just wonderful such a nice guy a complete gentleman really funny really talented you know we have a large collection of just a minute episodes mum and i that we've listened to and i have a brilliant live rocky horror show album from 1998 where he's the narrator on stage and the audience absolutely love him and he was also in an episode of Doctor Who called The Curse of Fenric which I saw recently when I was looking through the Hooniverse and he tells of the TARDIS so it was a nice little surprise to see Nicholas Parsons in an episode of Doctor Who he was very good in that so yeah um, he had a very prolific career he was very talented and he's still very sadly missed so it was really nice of Radio 4 Extra to do that special little tribute to him And then in terms of miscellaneous comedies, The Last Leg obviously had a couple of specials as well. For the Christmas episode, they had Alison Hammond and Tom Davis with Joe Pasquale as Santa and a cameo by the Cheeky Girls and a great choir that was in there as well. And then in the New Year's Eve show, which lasted for two hours rather than one, they had Ed Gamble, Sean Walsh, Judy Love, Carl smith Bino, and Susie Ruffle, plus Hunter from Gladiators and cameos by David Tennant and Harry Hill. So both of those episodes are very funny. They're always entertaining. And then over on Sky, I saw a couple of episodes called The Unofficial Science of 
where they look at different stunts from classic films and you know how deadly they would actually be and how they could be done much more safely. So Chris Ramsey and Paul Chowdhury looked at stunts from Die Hard, marking 35 years since its release, like the fire hose jump and the elevator explosion and Hans Gruber's Big Fall, stuff like that. And then DJ Greg James and comedian Maisie Adam looked at the Indiana Jones films, talking about the Boulder stunt, of course, and Quicksand and the Minecart and things like that. So they were entertaining, and in both episodes they were led along by an engineer called Zoe who showed them how things could go wrong and how they could be done more safely in an entertaining way and Alex Brooker was in both episodes interviewing members of the cast and crew as well it all follows on from last year's episode about Home Alone so it's nice that this is a bit of a continuing series every year really and then last but not least, we come on to a few music bits as well. The Rolling Stones had a new album out recently, of course, called Hackney Diamonds, which I was going to review after its original release in October, but they then released a new deluxe edition in December with some live tracks from their launch gig from the album as well. So I held back and decided to review it in this post instead. And yeah, they've still got it. I mean, Mick Jagger's never been the best singer, but he's always had that raw energy and power and emotion, everything that really makes him sound good. And Keith Richards and Ronnie Wood have still got it as well. Obviously, Charlie Watts is no longer with them but he is on a couple of tracks which is nice the lead single from the album is called Angry and it was nominated for a Grammy Award and it is a good track it's got a nice powerful catchy beat to it and a nice riff and everything and some people don't like the autotune that's on there but I think it's used to good effect it's not over the top or anything like that so I quite like it and then the album also has some nice collaborations as well Paul McCartney's on a track called Bite My Head Off which is a bit of a headbanger and Elton John is on a couple of tracks called Get Close and Live by the Sword and there's also near the end a beautiful track called Sweet Sounds of Heaven lasting seven minutes that includes Lady Gaga on vocals and Stevie Wonder on piano in a kind of bluesy ballad kind of style that builds nicely as it goes along so that's a nice track as well and the rest of the track list is good as well there's a calming country song called Dreamy Skies and there's more upbeat songs like Whole Wide World and so on the bonus seven tracks from the live launch gig are good as well so yeah it's a nice album it's not one of the best albums but it's still a pretty solid album which is all you can hope for and expect from them really so yeah it's great to have them back once again and then last but far from least, there's a great opportunity to mention my favourite band of all time, Queen, because Sky Arts had a couple of new programmes on in relation to them over the festive period. So first, there was Queen and Adam Lambert live in Japan, and this was a concert from 2014 to nearly 10 years ago as part of the Summer Sonic Festival. A few tracks were included on the Live Around the World release that I got a few years ago, but it was only ever fully released, the concert, on DVD and Blu-ray in Japan itself. And this seems to be the first time it's been broadcast in the UK. So I have seen it online before, but it was nice to see it properly on tv because it's really good adam lambert does a great job he's not trying to replace freddie they do honor him very very nicely you know freddie does appear during a couple of songs you know in love of my life and bohemian rhapsody and yeah it's just a really fun show lots of the big hits some of the notable ones apart from the ones i've just mentioned featuring freddie are teo toriate which is a beautiful love song especially written for their japanese fans that brian sings with the crowd these are the days of our lives, which Roger Taylor comes out to sing while footage of the band in the olden days is shown on the back screen. And I Was Born to Love You, which is a great uh, rocking version of a solo song of Freddie's that the original band never performed live. So, yeah, that's a really fun concert. I enjoyed watching that. And then there was also a lovely documentary about the Freddie Mercury auction that I saw at Sotheby's last year. It was a great privilege and a thrill to see that in person, looking through so many of his different personal possessions before they were all auctioned off. And it's a shame that they've all been kind of sold off this spread about all over the place now really yes some money to go to AIDS charities which is great but it's a shame that still his stuff is all out there all spread out now but yeah it was a really nice documentary talking about how Freddie's personal life differed from his stage persona and they looked through lots of the key items that are up for sale of course and they showed you how much money some of them sold for colossal amounts of money it's incredible how much people paid for them and you can even see the full bidding for the Bohemian Rhapsody sale on the Sotheby's website which is quite an exciting thing to watch really and there were insightful interviews with a couple of Sotheby's his staff members as well as an international memorabilia specialist and the official queen photographer Dennis O'Regan whose photo of Freddie on stage headed up the publicity for the auction and there are a few little archive clips from Freddie and Brian talking about things as well and there are little brief glimpses of other auctions too for David Bowie, George Michael and Dave Gilmore just to show how popular musicians items can be. So yeah I enjoyed watching that it was a really interesting and lovely program and a great tribute to Freddie. And that is it. That is the end of my Christmas favourites video for another year. So I hope you found bits and pieces in there of interest to you as always. And thank you very much for watching to the end. Even if you skip bits along the way, I do appreciate you taking an interest in any of the things that I do. That's why I do these things. So thank you very much for following me and supporting me as always. And I'll continue to share my adventures in the year ahead, of course. 
In terms of the immediate future, there's nothing special planned. There's one thing I know I'm doing in January and then beyond that into February, I don't know what's coming up just yet, but there's always a chance to book things and do things on a whim and whatever. So we'll see what happens. But my next post in any case will be in March in terms of a video, um, because there's no point in doing a video just to cover the last couple of weeks of January. Now this video is already covered halfway through January. So I'll just do a video to cover the rest of January and all of February in one go. That also then gives me a bit of a break so I can catch up on various bits and pieces. There's DVDs and Blu-rays I've bought that I haven't even touched yet. There's some other bits and pieces on TV and online that I haven't caught up with either because of all the Doctor Who and comedy and Christmas stuff getting in the way. But in the meantime, I hope you have a lovely year ahead, whatever you have planned, whatever fate decides to throw at you. And yeah, let's just see what it brings for all of us. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. As per usual, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe as always. And I will see you for more posts in my blog and another video here very soon. Bye for now.